Okay. So, good morning, everyone, to our latest edition, the 79th episode, straight episode of History Matters, and so does coffee. Um, I will acknowledge I am not drinking coffee this morning for the first time. However, I am drinking ginger tea or something. At any rate, welcome. Um, today, as advertised in advance, uh, we're going to be talking about Congress, uh, Congress in the past, which hopefully will give us some insight into Congress in the present. Um, there's a lot to say about Congress, but before I launch into that, um, I want to turn things over to my partner in crime, Matt, who will offer the rules of the game. And good morning, everybody. Welcome, and thank you for joining us again today. We're really excited to uh, continue this incredible community. So thank you all for being here. Rules of the game are as follows. We do encourage you to use chat. Um, please put in uh, anything and everything that, you, that is on your mind, but we just ask that you please keep it family friendly and of course, germane to the conversation. Um, if you do have questions, we ask that you put those in Q and A. That's the easiest way for us to uh, keep track of questions and keep things moving along. Um, so please, even if it's a random thought that you want us to talk about, please put it in Q&A uh, so that we can uh, sort through those and make sure that we're, we're talking about what you care about. That's what we like to do. Um, and as always, if you like what we do here at National Council of History Education, please join us. You can visit us on the web at www.ncatteach.org, or you can visit us on uh, social media. We are on all the major platforms, so please join us except TikTok. I have not figured out a way to make TikTok work for us yet, but uh, I'm trying. I, I'm, it's only a matter of time, Matt. It's only a matter of time. I've thought that, of that. Will, that will be our next assignment for our uh, <laughs> brand new program assistant, who I want to give a shout out to today. Um, Dalton Savage has joined NCHE as a program assistant, uh, handling uh, a lot of our social media and we website updates and all that kind of good stuff. Um, he's also the uh, president of the, or president or chair, whatever the term is, the head of the Oklahoma National Council or Oklahoma Council for History Education. Nice. Um, so uh, we have, he's doing a little do double dipping, but we're so thrilled to have him on board. He's a terrific uh, young, per young person. I don't want to say too young. He's um, <laughs> not. He's a phenomenal teacher in his own right. And we're uh, really lucky to have him on as our program assistant. So yeah. Um, and uh, lastly, please do check out what we're doing on the website because we, we are announcing programs left and right. Our first two colloquia have launched and are filling up very quickly. So please sign up for those. Uh, one is in Nashville um, and one is in um, Florida. And, and who doesn't want to go to Florida in January? So uh, please join us for those. Uh, check those out. Those are on our website as well. With that, I'll turn it over to Joanne for some Fascinating conversation. National discussion. And I have to say, uh, anyone who's new, newbie, is uh, my history bird, <laughs> uh, Parakeet, and he's already peeping. So he's happy to be here too. I think you can probably hear him. Okay. Um, okay. So, Congress. Um, obviously, let me change my screen here. Okay. Um, so, I suppose this week, I don't, sometimes I have to explain the <laughs> logic that I have. Uh, for wanting to talk about what I want to talk about, but um, Congress, I don't think I really have to. Uh, it's at the center of the news for a lot of different reasons. I'm changing the view back because it's weird. There we go. For a lot of different reasons. Um, and thus, it seemed to me that it would be a useful thing to talk about uh, Congress and uh, what it's been like in the past, and I suppose more in relation to what we're seeing today, what makes it work and what makes it not work in a broad sense. Um, there are certain things about Congress um, that are kind of intangible, but really important that I'm gonna circle back to at the end of my comments this morning about what makes it run. Um, as, a, as a political historian and, a, and as someone who studies um, political culture, I'm always really interested in the intangible things that people assume uh, and that make them take political actions. Uh, and that's just as true of Congress as it is of politics in general. However, um, before I do that, I wanna talk a little bit, um, first off about as a historian, 
something that occurred to me recently, and it's going to launch us off uh, into our discussion this morning. So as a historian who, you know, most recently wrote a book on pretty much the first half of the 19th century, um, I spent a lot of time uh, in newspapers, in magazines, trying to get a sense of how people were reading about Congress. And one of the things that's been striking me about this current moment is that in much of the 19th century, unlike much of the 20th century, um, Congress and not the president had by far the most column inches in newspapers, by far the most newspaper coverage. Newspapers included um, sometimes short versions, but entire debates, long, long at length. And initially I was just amazed. I thought, wow, that's, you know, are, are people really paying attention? You know, what, what is the story of this? Now, the answer to that, and I'm gonna show you how I knew that people are paying attention, um, is that indeed Congress was where the action was, where it was assumed to be in the realm of politics in the 19th century. Congress was where, um, in a sense, you know, uh, power was taken and given in a more ongoing basis than the executive, the presidency has um, evolved uh, over the decades and centuries in a way that is partly reflected in this, that Congress seemed to be at the center of everything. Um, but the way that I discovered the degree to which people in the 19th century actually not only see the congressional debates, but read them and absorbed some of them was um, a magazine that I discovered long into my research for my, my recent book on violence in Congress. And the magazine is called Vanity Fair, which is not related to the current Vanity Fair. This one was a humor magazine uh, from New York that I think its first issue was in 1859. So it was quite a time if you're gonna have a humor magazine, bringing it out in this hyper-polarized time when people are behaving in extreme manners, they had a lot that they could mock in one way or another in this magazine. Now, personally, I came to call Vanity Fair Congressional Fights Quarterly because every issue, like every issue talked about or showed or mocked in one way or another, arguments, fighting, nastiness, it was all over Vanity Fair. As a matter of fact, uh, the first, I'll see if I, if I can remember this, I will send to Matt the cover of the first issue. The first issue shows a congressional debate and basically people are just throwing things at each other. There's a podium flying through the air and a pistol and um, some sort of small animal. <laughs> anyway, that's Congressional Fights Quarterly, Vanity Fair. What I wanted to offer you was um, a story in Vanity Fair titled A Day in the House, which revealed to me um, the degree to which folks knew Congress. And I'm gonna read it because it's wonderful and ridiculous, but the important thing to remember here is in one way or another, there are aspects of actual debate from that week being brought in to this longer um, story. So essentially what I found by looking in the newspapers, I'll read in a moment, is the sort of single sentences here and there from people's speeches on the floor or comments on the floor, individual sentences were taken and put in these running humor columns. And you really had to know the whole debate from which they came to understand why it was funny because I could, but I was like, oh, but you need to know that this guy is normally like this, but this time he was like this. And that day he did this. So the, the amount of knowledge that people potentially had was, was stunning. But I wanna read you one or two passages just to give you a sense of what Congress appeared like at the time. Okay, a day in the house. Um, it reported a day's proceedings uh, and that largely consisted of um, an exchange of insults Congress style. So for example, um, one person says, one congressman says, without calling in question the integrity of Mr. Sherman, he, this congressman would say that that gentleman was not fit, politically speaking, to iron shirts in third class laundry. So, okay, so that's using congressional rhetoric and yeah, and in and this particular instance, then there's a fist fight. At this point, this continues with their story. Some evil disposed person here cried, order, this was the signal for instantaneous uproar. Then ensued rare pegging and stepping, unexceptional clinching, fainting, and planting of one twos on pimple and in wind. 
The sergeant at arms, having at length detected a foul blow on the part of an inexperienced new member, interposed and said that if the disturbance continued, he should be compelled to exclude the reporters. Okay, that, boy, does that tell you a lot, <laughs> right? This stuff is going on. Uh, the reporters are not supposed to report it. If it gets worse, the reporters will be taken from the room. Um, they're making fun of it, but they're also acknowledging uh, and sort of pointing a finger at the fact that that Congress, you know, I love the fact that um, some ill, evil disposed person cried order and this was the signal for in instantaneous disorder. Um, a later issue of Vanity Fair included an advertisement for, and this is the title of this false book, The Congressman's Guide to Fame or The True Vocabulary of Vituperation. And basically it's supposed to be, according to this ad, an alphabetical catalog of insults. And on the advertisement, there is um, an example of the book being put in use by a congressman. And uh, it says, this is a quote, do we not know this congressman for a babbler, for a blasted, blattering, blustering, brawling blower? Um, so again, there's a magazine that's sort of capturing the Congress of the moment and showing wide familiarity with it. But here's where I really wanna talk about um, what that meant, that wide familiarity. Um, hang on, I've gotta move this a little bit here. So I've talked a little bit before um, about the impact of the telegraph uh, on politics and on Congress. Um, and it had a huge impact. And part of that impact was that words spoken on the floor of Congress could potentially reach a huge, a broad, a sweeping public, far broader public than before and much more quickly than before. So that whatever happened on the floor of Congress always potentially had a national audience, but it was a very censored select image of Congress that went out into the press um, with the telegraph. And that comes along in the late 1840s. So we're now talking about the 1850s as the slavery debate is really peaking at that moment the, the nation continues to move west. There are new states, Kansas, Nebraska, being potentially added to the union. And every new state that gets potentially added to the union brings up the question of slavery. Will it be a free state or will it be a slave state? Now you have the telegraph. And what you see is more extreme debate in Congress being spread throughout the nation ever more quickly and preventing um, people from basically editing or calming down some of what gets said on the floor. So the the timing, the, the sort of coincidence of timing has a lot to do with the um, sort of spiking of what's going on in Congress. And it really, um, as a matter of fact, I'm, so this afternoon I'm going to um, Philadelphia to give a lecture and it, it's um, aspects of the congressional community. It's members of the congressional community that I'm going to be talking to. So um, I was just writing about some of these things that I'm gonna be saying to some of those people. And, and one of the things that I mentioned was, um, and I know I've said this before, the, the telegraph being the equivalent of social media, the problem of the telegraph being the equivalent of social media in our time, meaning basically um, it's a form of communication that no one controls or if someone does control it, they're not supposed to, or they're supposed to in a different way. I'm not even gonna go into the details of that, but at any rate, it's fast. Uh, it goes in unexpected directions. You can't ever really tell like who's on it, who's sending information, where does it come from? Was that person trustworthy? All of these things were true of the telegraph. All of these things are true of social media. And we're experiencing now what happens when you're flooded really quickly with information or, or words or dramatic statements that come from a politician's mouth and you see them 20 seconds after, right? Someone is in the room and says, you know what this person just said? And then you're left in the situation did they say it? If they did say it, what does it mean? Maybe it's out of context. The person who said it doesn't get to explain it. It really, that kind of speed in politics um, really intensifies um, animosity in one way or another. It, there's no cooling off period for anything. And I know I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. If you think about the fact that democracy is a form of government that is grounded on communication between people in power, people the, the um, public has given power to, and uh, the people themselves, so politicians and the public in one way or another are engaged in the conversation of democracy. Any form of technology that shapes that conversation is going to shape democracy. And that's what we're seeing right now. Social media is 
um, in ways both good and bad, and I'm not going to sit here trying to think of good ways, but I'm sure we all can think of some bad ways, um, is really shaping the course of democracy in some ways, and um, sort of as with the telegraph, uh, with new uh, forms of technology or, or new-ish forms of technology being used in new ways, it can be hard to know what to do, how to respond, what the proper course of action is. So we are really, I, I over and over again in my head when I think about the current situation um, with social media, I kind of feel that we're in a sort of wild, wild west of communication where we don't really fully know what's happening or who's doing it, but what we do know is it has a big impact, often a not very good one. So Congress always, in a sense, beginning in the 1850s, has had this issue with the fact that it is supposed to be a public-minded institution. The people who are there were put there by the public who want their representatives to do what they want their representatives to do. As I've said a million times on this program in tweets and everywhere else, accountability, the accountability of members of Congress to the public is one of the core aspects of democracy and one of the ways in which members of Congress are held accountable is from the public knowing what it is that they're doing or voting for or saying. So um, all of that is sort of bound up in the ways in which Congress is increasingly public. You know, years ago, I gave um, a talk, uh, I, I think maybe at um, Oxford, and a political scientist said to me, you know, um, political scientists claim that the more transparent a political body is, the better. But what you're suggesting, Joanne, is that transparency isn't always better. And it's like, yeah, I guess that is what I'm saying is public is good, transparency can be complicated. And that's some of what we're seeing here. Now that leads to um, a question that I really wanted to discuss today. I, know, I realize I'm sort of running low on time, but we of course, for those of you who are new, will have questions. Um, it leads to a question which is given everything that I just said, what, how does Congress work best? What does a functional Congress look like? Which is a big question. Um, what are the things that hold Congress together or that should hold Congress together? Um, and in a way, if you step back and think really broadly about Congress as an institution, a functional Congress is grounded on a number of very powerful, but really subjective and somewhat vulnerable things. So one of those, subjective, but maybe in this case slightly less so, but as we're seeing in recent times more so, definitely vulnerable, has to do with the rules and rituals of Congress. There are certain things you're supposed to do in Congress, certain things you're not supposed to do in Congress, and the reasoning behind that often has to do with holding the community of Congress together, enabling people to feel like, and I'm going to come back to this idea in a moment, enabling people to feel like everyone is on the same playing field, that they're, they're sort of fighting on equal ground, that it's a fair fight, that whatever they're doing, there's a general agreement on some aspect of the rules. Um, this came into my mind, actually yesterday, I was um, recording um, my uh, podcast. I know someone has that on their bingo card and I'm not, I can't help it. I have to say the word podcast. Um, we were talking about among other things, um, Tip O'Neill, uh, who got very angry at another member of Congress who um, apparently waited until most members of Congress were not on the floor, but C-SPAN was still covering the debates and said a lot of really negative things about people who weren't there and made it look as though that he was in the room saying those things and that the people that they were being said about were not responding. And O'Neill basically said in a, in a passage that uh, I was looking at yesterday in preparation for what we were talking about, he said to this congressman, like, that's not, that's not the way we do things here, right? I think later in his memoir, he says, there are rules. You do not attack members of this body when they are not here to defend themselves. And what struck me about that is that um, that could be a direct quote from 1840. You know, I mean, at, if you look in my book, I'm sure it's in there, that, that there's a whole chapter on, on the rules of fighting. And one of them is, if you're gonna insult somebody, that person needs to be in their seat. And if that person, if you do that and the person isn't in their seat, you get reprimanded. And in, in one ridiculous case, the person who committed that crime says, I didn't have my glasses on. I couldn't see the seat. Whatever the excuse is, it was widely assumed that that kind of rule or ritual of congressional debate 
um, the idea that you hold the body together by at least abiding by certain sort of ground level rules, like if you're going to attack somebody, do it while they're here. Um, that's been true for a long time, and it continues to be true. But the other things that I think related to what I've just said that hold Congress together um, are really subjective and really vulnerable things. And they are a sense of fairness, a sense of rights, and the feelings of people in the body as well as people in the nation. Um, if you think about it, the credibility of Congress rests on the fact that the people in that body feel that in one way or another, the procedures of Congress uh, the working of Congress enables everyone in one way or another to be on, again, an even playing field that they all have a chance to do what they need to do to try and get what they want done. Now, there's obviously never been an assumption in Congress that if you want something, you get it. But the credibility of the institution relies on the fact that you assume that, okay, there's a majority and a minority and the majority often gets what it wants and the minority doesn't or the minority sometimes plays quick and dirty with some of the rules uh, and the majority doesn't get what they want. But in one way or another, there is a ground level assumption that, and Newby feels very strongly about rules. Um, there's a ground level assumption that whatever the fight is, whatever the debate is, whatever the argument is, that there's a sort of ground level of, of fairness that is at play that enables the process of politics to work, that enables the kind of dialogue and negotiation that needs to happen to work. Because what do those things rely on but trust, right? They rely on the fact that if you make a negotiation or an agreement and someone says that they're going to do that in some way or another, most of the time at least, you need to trust that that will actually happen. If it doesn't happen and if that's consistently the fact, then people in Congress are gonna have far less ability to trust each other, to deal with each other, to negotiate with each other, potentially even to socialize with each other, which over time has become more of an issue with Congress. So if you think about the fact that really the credibility of Congress as an institution and the fundamental working of it relies on things like a sense of fairness or the equal rights of everybody engaged in congressional debate or the feelings of those involved in the debate and that it, it matters, um, how they're being treated and how they're responding to it. If you think about how all of those things, in addition to assumptions and rules and rituals, are holding Congress together, important things, things that I can sit here and talk about, very vulnerable and subjective things. Now, having said that, I, I will say, and this will not be a surprise to anyone, but I'll say it anyway, um, this is not the first moment that Congress has been in um, a state of, what I want to call it, disorder, um, highly polarized. This has not been the first highly polarized moment in Congress when um, some members of Congress have made it very difficult uh, to have others engage with them when there are all kinds of, let's say shenanigans, malarkey and shenanigans um, going on in Congress. Um, and that it is a place right now that's full of dissension in one way or another. And um, some people appear to be playing fast and easy with the rules in a way that seems to undercut the credibility of the institution. It's not the first time that sort of stuff has happened. But at this particular moment, as we watch that on an ongoing basis, we shape Congress, but Congress shapes us, right? So in the same way that um, I, members of Congress who were smacking each other around in the 1850s or attacking each other. Um, some people thought it was funny and other people wisely thought that the impact of this is that people are going to assume the state of the nation is being reflected that way. That's what we see when we look at Congress. We see or we assume that we're seeing the state of the nation, which may or may not be true, but what goes on in Congress. So if, if there's a total inability for people on different sides to engage with each other, to talk with each other, to trust each other. Not only does that undercut the institution of Congress, but it suggests to the nation that that's the state of the nation, which gets us back to communication and media because I, I do think um, we really don't have a clear sense of how many people think various things on even on polarized issues. There are loud people who have loud things to say about certain polarized issues, but it's easy to assume that loudness equals majority, and that's not necessarily true. 
So for all of these reasons, the things that make Congress work well, sense of fairness, rights, feelings, ability to have faith in the institution, when those things begin to get undercut on a sustained and ongoing basis, that becomes a real problem. Because if Congress isn't credible, if you can't turn to Congress or your member of Congress to represent your interest in some way, where do you turn? What do you do? You can protest. You hopefully can vote in a free and fair election. But Congress plays a really central role in, I think, the identity of the nation and the self-awareness of the nation and the functioning of the nation. And so I think that, um, in a sense, the essence of a democratic Republican government, at the core, there has to be a functional Congress. We're looking at a moment when there are lots of things at stake and often it's not very functional, again, not the first time, but um, I think that as you watch what's going on in Congress, consider what I just said, that things that are important are things that you wouldn't necessarily think about as being important. Like, you know, trusting in rules, faith in the institution. Those things are really intangible. Those are not things you often think about, right? You, you just, certainly when you look at Congress, you think about um, like capital R rules and, and standards and the way things are done in a more formal sense than you don't attack someone when they're not in their seat. But think about all of the ways in which these intangibles really powerfully shape the dynamics between people, what they assume about Congress, how Congress works, and thus the nation and us. That should help you, I think, not only understand better some of the outcomes that are happening in Congress right now that might in some cases seem either unexpected um, or unpredictable, um, but I think will also um, enable you to get a sense of maybe what can happen or needs to happen for things to get beyond this point because what Congress models has an impact. Um, that's the comments I'm going to give this afternoon. I basically conclude with some kind of a discussion of that. Um, what Congress models shapes the nation uh, in the same way that the nation shapes Congress, but what Congress models to the nation matters um, because in some way or another, Congress has a big chunk of national identity in its grasp. Okay. Um, I am two minutes past my chatting time. Um, I am going to stop chatting and I'm not going to forget my mug. Why? Because before Carolee even said mug, 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 someone said, <laughs> don't forget Carolee to ask for the mug. So someone, someone beat Carolee to it. Okay, um, this is a very logical mug, but it was the only one that could be used for this occasion. It's my mug from the US Capitol. Well done, well done. Which no explanation required. But I haven't used it in a while because it wasn't necessarily as clear cut that not only is it appropriate, but I got it in the Capitol building, I believe, after having spoken with a member of Congress. So very cool. There you go. Okay. Oh, Capitals on the bingo card. So I, so I just helped someone get bingo. Okay. So that is the, the mug for anyone who's new. Uh, this is what we do every week is I have a mug that relates to the theme that we're talking about. And Matt has a background that Indeed. relates to something that we're talking about. I missed guesses in them earlier. Did anybody? Again, I think this is way too easy, unfortunately, and I apologize for not being on my game this week. This is very much plan B, but this is the um, Rayburn reception room and the Capitals just out, outside of the Democratic cloakroom. I was desperately trying to find a really good cloakroom picture, and I could not find a good cloakroom picture because I thought, like rooms, a lot, a lot of stuff goes down. A lot of stuff goes down though, based on what we were going to talk about. I'm like the cloakroom, the cloakroom, the cloakroom, and could not find it. So I got the next best thing. This is right outside the Democratic cloakroom, um, uh, House Democratic House cloakroom, excuse me. Uh, and this is the Rayburn reception room, and uh, members of Congress will use this room for um, basically photo opportunities, press, meeting with constituents, odds and ends, et cetera, et cetera. And there is, thank you, Jim, for a love for that, uh, for that link, because that's, um, I think it's less obvious than you thought. I think where I got the picture from. I think it's less obvious than you thought it was. Okay. Um, because some people are, are acknowledging um, Excellent. 
what um Vita said way too easy would be the set of cheers. <laughs> <laughs> You've already done that. So. I've already done that one. I, I try not to duplicate. Uh, like Joanne, <laughs> no. I try not to duplicate if I possibly can. So. Or friends. That's true. That would do. Yes, yeah, or friends. I so, do have I, I do have a picture of the set of friends. I don't think I've used it in this show though. Okay. Yay, lots of questions today. Are we ready to get Absolutely. going or do you... we are we are we are ready to get going. I will say that putting up friends in the background for this discussion would be totally ironic. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. um so this is a good one. I, I'm gonna start with this because Dave uh, emailed us separately and we you and I have not had a chance to talk about it because it's been that kind of week. But Dave did email us this question, and I think it's important to start with it and acknowledge that it's a really good question. So um, Dave wants to know what what was or is the logic behind empowering one senator to place a hold on a presidential nomination for, say, an ambassador, and what is the history around this issue? I'm thinking of one particular senator from Texas, um, you know, whose last name starts with a C and ends in a ruse. Um, who put a hold on about 20 nominations recently? Well, I, I actually don't have a quick and dirty uh, or even um, slow and neat um, answer to that question. I will say that um, it's always worth noting if you're talking about um, what, what, why do certain things or certain things allowed to happen? In some cases, that goes all the way back, you know, as far as like structural things that, that are true of Congress. Some of those structural things, even though the constitution, as I've said before, is kind of a framework of a government. Uh, and so it's very little detail in it about very many things. Um, but when the constitution was written, there was no assumption about political parties and divisions of that kind. Mm -hmm. um, People assumed that there would be opposition, you know, not like one opposition, but that there would be people arguing with each other. There would be lots of different views. They would bang up against each other. And in the banging up against each other, something would be decided. So if you take partisan politics out of the picture, that makes that kind of thing certainly less obvious, a less obvious thing to happen. Not that it wouldn't happen before, that it hasn't happened before, but um, some of what we see in Congress now that seems dysfunctional is more a product of party than it is a, a product of Congress itself. Okay, um, Dale, along with the changes in media technology, did the general pub advancement in public education also contribute to the accountability of congressional members. So repeat it for me. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. And it, along with the changes in media technology, did the general advancement in public education also contribute to the accountability of congressional members? Um, well, I think the, the, the easy um, object sort of unplugged into reality answer to that would be yes. Be and, and that was an assumption, you know, um, and I know I've said this before here too. Um, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson felt very adamantly that um, everyone or every white man um, needed to have a certain degree of education because at least three years, because they needed to understand threats to the nation so that they could ward them off. So, and he also thought that everyone for that reason should study history. Ta -da! But regardless of that, um, the fact of the matter is there was an assumption at a very early point um, that education would make people aware of what the government's supposed to be like, how it works, and what are its greatest threats. So public education, if you think of it in the simplest way, um, thinking of it as um, just spreading education broadly and at least giving some minimal level of, I don't wanna say equality, but um, whatever we wanna call that, enabling a, a wide swath of people to have some degree of education, since I know it differs widely in America, but I, I am a product of public education, so I'm a big proponent of public education. Um, so I think that in that sense, sure, it, it mm -hmm. adds accountability because it, it people ideally know more about their government. And I know that we've had a, a conversation like this before in which people brought up civics. We used to learn civics in school, and I don't have wise words to say about why it went away or how and why it should come back, um, but I, I do think 
that they're linked. I, mm -hmm. And I think that assumption of their being linked is a, is a longstanding one for sure. I also think though accountability, uh, you know, in a sense, that's the most fundamental thing to understand about our government. Um, so that goes beyond public school. The last thing actually I'll say about public school is um, one thing that it teaches you, which is good um, for our government and good for democracy is diversity. Because mm -hmm. um, in a public school, very often there's far greater diversity of one kind or another um, than there often is in private schools, not true of all private schools, definitely not true of all public schools, but in general. And that's just a fine thing to live in and see if you're learning what it means to be an American. And I'm going to refrain from talking because I will take the next 20 minutes providing you with a long dissertation on my opinions about public schooling and its relationship to history. So, but that's a whole other conversation. Maybe that should be our next conversation series. I'll have to Good find way. a historian of, of a American, um, American education to spar with. Um, <laughs> Let's see. I want to get back to the rules of Congress that we started with with Dave. Um, Lisa asked this question. In what ways have the rules of Congress more broadly changed today from those in the past? What, what, what do you see as sort of the, the sort of major moments or the, um, or the general themes of how rules, the quote, quote unquote rules of Congress have changed um, across time? OK. Um... Before I go into that, I just want to mention Gloria Sesso just said that Johan Neem wrote a book on public education. He did semi-recently, and I wanted to mention it because Johan is a friend and he wrote a good book. Okay, rules. So how the rules have changed over time and, and what that shows us. Um, so one sort of dramatic moment that changed things in Congress, this gets back to what I've already talked about, which has to do with the, the impact of party. Um, it wasn't until the late... 19th century, pretty much the last maybe two decades of the 19th century, when you had um, a speaker in the House of Representatives, for example, of talking about rules, these are the rules of the House, um, who decided that parties should be not only central to how Congress functioned, but that it was his job as speaker to help his party, the majority party, take control of things and get what they wanted. He was blunt about saying that, you know, we have a majority and a minority and majority rule is majority rule and minority rule can be even worse than majority rule. So I think, you know, if rules are going to help one party get things done and the other party gets to watch a lot, I'm OK with that. And so he changed a lot of rules to help that. One of the things he did was, well, among other things, give the rules committee more power so that he could invent new rules. <laughs> along with his party to help his party more than other parties. Um, he made it so that speakers got to name chairs of committees without asking, um, actually, no, it wasn't that. He, he could, forgive me, um, shift things from the floor to committees without asking the permission of Congress. And of course, he had the power to make the people heads of committees. So that was another way of giving the majority party power. So the, the really short version of what I'm saying here is um, a major change in rules was the sort of tweaking of them to give the majority party an advantage. And that's the late, that, that comes at with the sort of modernization of political parties uh, in American history. And that's um, kind of a post-Civil War um, we have a lot of business and a lot of things to do, and we need to sort of operate in a slightly different way moment in time. Um, <clears throat> so before I go on to the next question, uh, Jeannie asks a question, which I'm assigning to Annie. Okay, but I'm going to, before you say that, Dale says, remember to set your chat to everyone, because he, supposedly some people seem to be missing other people. So everyone uh, is apparently the choice in the latest version of Zoom, which I even did not know. So, okay, <laughs> go ahead. This, this is for a few, you don't have to answer this now, Annie. It's, it's just something <laughs> I know is in your wheelhouse. Uh, Jeannie would like, uh, like to know, is there a hist histomap of congressional control or power? She loves graphic information. And I know Annie 
oh. is phenomenal at this work. Um, uh, one of the nice things about getting to know our community is we get to know the things that are uh, important to you and the things that you do for a living. And um, Annie is phenomenal. So, uh, so Jeannie is looking for a HISTA map of congressional control and power. Um, I'm guessing throughout history. So wow. Annie. If there is one, I would. <laughs> Flushing and looking at maps is the proper response. <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> um, so just as a, this is a good, good. Um, we're going to segue into into kind of jumping back between the, the past and the present here in a minute. But um, as a logistical question, Scott wants to know what is the actual role of the sergeant of arms. What authority does this person has? Like, have where where does it come from, and what maybe could you talk a little bit about what is that role? Because it sounds like, based on our conversation today, that sort of might be important. <laughs> well, the sergeant at arms certainly, um, over the long term, looking back in time, um, it was assumed you know the sergeant at arms was the person who, um, among other things, helped to maintain order mm -hmm. in the houses of Congress. So. Um, for example, there's one uh, enormous brawl that takes the entire floor of the house, I believe. And when it, it erupts for the first time, someone calls for the sergeant at arms. And he, he has, usually when he comes into the midst of disorder, he has the mace with him. And the mace is the symbol of the house. So, you know, it's supposed to strike awe into you that if you see the mace. So the sergeant at arms raced to the scene of the bursting of fight, fighting breaking out with the mace. And no one really cared about the mace because they were really engaged in fighting. So the, according to the sergeant at arms, who I think in this case published a memoir, he was like, I rushed in with the mace and then no one paid attention to me. So I rushed out without the, with the mace. And then I came back trying to figure out what to do. So in part, he's supposed to maintain order. And that often is a difficult thing to do. Um, and in a larger sense, order defined more broadly, he, he is kind of representing with the mace as a figure, the body of the house. But um, the sergeant at arms, actually, in, and in former times, the sergeant at arms often would, if they needed a quorum and they, for a vote and there wasn't one present, sometimes the sergeant at arms would round members of Congress up and drag them back in. Uh, OK, it's time for a vote. You sh are supposed to be here. Um, so kind of uh, a figure of order, imposing order in some way. But what I don't know for sure is what the contemporary, what the modern sergeant at arms does that may be different from what the older sergeant at arms does? That is a question I don't know and that actually I'm interested in knowing. I just, I have not uh, investigated that in the current Congress. The other uh, person in Congress that came up recently was the parliamentarian. Wasn't there like some mm -hmm. point recently it was like, well, the parliamentarian says you can't do X. And it's like, mm -hmm. who ever heard, like when is the parliamentarian stepped forward and said, you know, and it's an interesting question. Um, you know, there certainly in the decades I look at in the 19th century, um, people were asking parliamentary questions all the time. Right. And, you know, there's a way in which the rules can really help, because if you master those rules and deploy them really skillfully, the parliamentary rules, you could do a lot of good or bad, depending on what you want. So um, there was a clerk in the House who often was the guy who was called on to settle parliamentary um, questions. But that matters a lot, parliamentary questions, because that really, if you're, if it's just down to brute force of like, I want this, well, I don't want this, you can play with those rules in such a way that you get what you want. John Quincy Adams was, was the master of this. He knew parliamentary maneuvering better than anyone. So there he is, like, you know, one guy in the house after his presidency. And he, he could just twist and maneuver and switch around the rules and then sort of sit there laughing at the fact that, of course, he could do that. He knows what he wants and he would get what he wants that way. So um, parliamentarian is a different kind of order. Um, but I don't know why in this particular occasion, you know, why it, it appeared on that occasion more than any other time. But it's a similar kind of idea to the sergeant at arms in the sense of helping to maintain order in a body that for any number of reasons can become disordered, even not to an extreme violent degree, but just because of the actual issues being discussed. Um, okay, I'm gonna, 
I'm not going to ask that question. <laughs> I see, I see um, Dave uh, said master parliamentary rules, see Senator Byrd. Absolutely. Senator Byrd on the history of Congress and, and on the rules of Congress. Um, and those kinds of people become legendary because yeah. that's, a, that's a power of knowledge, right? That's a power grounded on knowledge of a shared system that no one else understands as well. So that's, that is something that, that deserves some respect. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, you know, one of the both compliments and criticisms of Mitch McConnell is that he's a master parliamentarian in that way. That he, he can, he uses the rules in the same way that um, folks like Byrd or John Quincy Adams maybe had done in the past, so. Um, moving, <laughs> what's that? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. maybe. I, I, it's I didn't complicated. Say it. It's complicated. <laughs> this is a nonpartisan show, so that, that's doing, doing everything I can to make it as yes. nonpartisan as possible. Um, so, and, and uh, somebody did ask, yes, I am a, I am a parliamentarian nerd. I do enjoy both Robert's rules of order and Mason's new rules of order. Which oh, really Matt, do. I didn't know this about I, you. I, I, I do. I, I enjoy it. I love the whole, the organization of it. It's, it's wow. It's, you got to yeah. look up Reed's rules. Reed's I've never, I've never experienced. That's, those Reed's are the ones rules. I was just talking about from the late okay. uh, 19th century. Okay. Cause in, uh, in Michigan, we use we use Mason's rules of order for the legislature, so that I know those fairly well. But the um, and I know I love Robert, this. Yeah, I love I, this new fact about you, Matt. I am a I'm a complete nerd when it comes to all these things. But nobody uh, people are, are less interested in that than some of these other great questions that we have. So I'm gonna um, Francesca ask a great question, which I want to um, get at, which is: Were congressmen the celebrities of their day? Hence the Vanity Fair and gossip. Oh, were they great. celebrities in the sense that maybe some um, legislatures are celebrities today? Um, some of them were. And I, I paused because it's also true that um, for much of the 19th century, uh, people who would be elected to Congress would serve one term and then would leave. So there aren't people who today maybe become celebrities because they're there for so long and they make a name for themselves. You tended not to have um, that kind of a member. But yeah, some of them were celebrities of a sort. Um, some of them because of who they were before they came to Congress or some of them because they were just big personalities who had a big influence and, and sort of played that up. Mm -hmm. um, some of them because they worked the press to make sure that that was true. So um, there's an... I think it's an Ohio congressman who um, stands up to a Southerner in the 19th century uh, who is threatening him, stands up to him, and then is not um, just doesn't think his moment gets enough play in the press. So he writes to a New York editor and says, like, oh, I want this played up, an editor who shares his political views, and it gets played up, and he becomes this big hero and, in a sense, becomes a celebrity. So I'm going to be a historian and say, that's a yes or no answer. Um, they could be. They very much could be. And you have people like Daniel Webster, you know, who hmm. students memorized his oratory in schools, right. um, or Henry Clay, or, you know, some yeah. of the guys who we even know now had that some major amounts of status at the time. Um, and people might not necessarily have known what all these people looked like. That's always a fascinating thing about celebrities of the past, like Thomas Jefferson, even way past George Washington. Washington, people might know what he looked like because there were so many portraits, but People often had no idea what public figures really looked like at all. Mm -hmm. um, but but very much in the by the time you get to the mid 19th century, yeah, there are celebrities and they played that up. Mm -hmm. um, Davy Crockett, you know, um, th there are people in political circles who use that for their political career, which is savvy and is certainly, as you said by starting out that question, something that we see very frequently today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and I just uh, offshoot that I, I wonder um, the uh, the question just went out of my head. It's obviously my own. I was going to hijack the conversation for two seconds there, but it, it oh, just went completely okay. out of my head. So I guess we'll move on to because there's uh, seriously want to compliment everybody on your questions this week. Great questions, and um, I know we're running a little bit short on time. Um, and I do want to say that we do have some new people coming in. Um, and 
some folks that are, I heard, I saw a conversation about lurking. Please don't lurk. Please. Oh, no, no. Lurk. I was teasing. There's uh, no lurker. <laughs> okay. I, I don't want any lurkers. I, I, if you have questions, let's answer, let's talk to them because. Um, no need you know, to lurk. The, the, the folks here are a welcoming community and um, I'm always interested in the kinds of questions that you all ask. So, um, so uh, Tim Johnson asks, Congress has to, seems to spend a lot of time working late nights and early mornings. Has this always been the case? What were the regular hours of Congress in earlier days? Um, I think there always were some times where there were late nights and early mornings. Mm -hmm. um, I think ending a session for the day was a, could be a political maneuver as well. But I do think there were some times where either um, the point of a session that you were in and certain things had to get done before the end of the session or something very controversial that people wanted to keep discussing. Um, conversations, debates would often go on very late and sometimes overnight and well into the morning. Um, and I've certainly seen lots of letters from members of Congress um, griping about that. Mm -hmm. In the first half of the 19th century, or the 18, be more specific, the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, overnight sessions were not, they, people tried to avoid them because they were inevitably violent and bad. Um, so when I was researching my last book, whenever I came across an overnight session, I would be like, okay, What's going to happen this night? Because something bad's going to happen. There was one night I think where there were three fights overnight, and it's because congressmen would, you know, go out to dinner and drink and have time to like think about what's going on, and then come back after dinner and be like ready to rumble in one way or another, and bad things would happen. So very often at that time period, they were trying to avoid overnight sessions. But um, you know, in some ways or or another, um, Congress does adapt, and but it takes you know to time and pressure and deadlines. It's just that people take advantage of time and pressure and deadlines sometimes to get what they want. I love that there's a congressional version of nothing good ever happens after 2 a.m. <laughs> yeah, the, well, you know, some of the committee rooms would be converted into bar rooms during overnight sessions, so they weren't helping the matter, really. <laughs> and who knows what was happening in those cloak rooms? I mean... I know. Do you know that... Um, there was a member of Congress who um, in like 1854 or something said that there should be a gun rack in the cloakroom. Seriously? That congressmen should be able to hang up their guns before they go into the House or the Senate. Really? And guess who made that suggestion? Preston Brooks, who came Charles Sumner. Really? Just did not need a gun. Yeah. Did not need a gun. He had a whole other gun. set of way. As, a, as an incoming South Carolina congressman, might not have been right new, but early in his career, said, yeah, we should have a congressional gun rack, basically. <laughs> you know, they're their guns because that, that, that they shouldn't be on the floor. And it obviously did not get voted for. But the fact that it was Preston Brooks and that, I don't know, two years later, you know, he savagely beat Charles Sumner to the ground. Interesting, interesting what history does. Uh, and, and what that's, I can't even tell you what that suggests about Preston Brooks. Probably says more about where the United States was in 1856 versus 1854. And the, right, right. I mean, you know, it, 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 the slavery question. Yeah. Right. And, and I mean, yeah, and even guns as a tool are, are thought of differently today than they were then. I mean, that's not, but that's, that's, of all the places to have a gun rack, that, that. <laughs> no, there was there there um, there were a lot of guns in a lot of pockets. At one point, I tried to figure out the number of weapons in Congress. It was very hard to do, um, but I found one letter in which one congressman uh, said to another in the House he thought that there maybe were seventy weapons, seventy members armed, which is a substantial number of people. So, and no oh. no gun rack, unfortunately. Is, is anybody else thinking about the line from Wayne's World that I don't even own a gun, let alone many guns that would necessitate an entire rack? Um, one last question. I know we're, we're a little bit over, but we've started late, so I'm going to ask one more question because I think it's an important one. Um, Kathleen uh, followed up with this question, which is, what is the overall impact in your mind on our democracy when political leaders, past or present, um, set a negative example? 
negative performances seem to be more important today than 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 um, maybe they were in the past. I'm reframing her question just a little bit here, but well, I, I think it's a good way. It's, I think it's a good way to summarize our conversation. Yeah, um, and I would say part of the answer is, um, in some ways, uh, in some parts of the country, bad behavior has always attracted attention and gotten some degree of approval. Um, often, the the it, in the case of my last book in the research I found was that um, congressional fighters and at, for a period that's mostly Southerners um, were routinely reelected. Uh, and one of them, my, my most frequent fighter, um, Henry Wise of Virginia, uh, at one point, someone says, we ought to throw you out of here. We ought to expel you from the house for the kind of behavior that you do. And Wise says, yeah, you go ahead. You go ahead and do that. They elect me to do just what I'm doing. So send me home. They're going to send me right back. This is why I'm here. And he's reelected, I believe, six times mm -hmm. in an age when people, you know, often are one term wonders. He gets yeah. reelected six times. So so bad behavior, you know, um, there's been a lot of it. And, and often it gets approved of in one way or another. The question then is not like what happens when you have bad members of Congress, but how does the institution, how does the of Congress itself deal with that kind of behavior? Um, I don't have the answer to that question, but you know, at least in say the 1850s, there was bad behavior, there would be discussion at least of what does this mean about Congress? Should we change the rules? Um, now it just appears as though things just sort of swimmingly move along. And there's an assumption, partly I think because of the blasts of information that we're constantly getting on all fronts, that it's just like, another drop in the bucket another drop in the bucket sort of so it, it's a it's a big problem in a different way which i guess get brings us back to what i mentioned earlier partly um bad behavior in congress has a a different and maybe weightier impact more emotional impact because of the speed and ways in which it can be spread to the public in ways that 10 years ago even it, it couldn't have been mm -hmm. Well, that's, I think, a good place to end for the day. And uh, thanks, everybody, for your questions. I apologize if I did not get to your question. Um, but uh, as, as always, thank you all for being here. And thanks for taking the time to uh, enjoy our conversation. And on behalf of the National Council for History Education, we invite you to uh, explore our resources um, and our programming. We have a lot of great uh, stuff coming up. And we want to try to expand that as much as we can. So thank you, everybody, for um, for being here and I'll let Joanne say her goodbyes. Okay, um, as always, thank you everyone who came this week for taking part in another conversation, another little bit of democracy and discussing these kinds of issues. Um, as always, I have no idea what we'll be discussing next week, but it'll be timely, whatever it is. Um, for those of you who are new, um, at this point, we segue into the after party. Uh, and what that means is that we no longer record what we're doing so that we can be a little more informal with our conversation. If you came here uh, online through the NCHE website, you just stay here. And as I always say, poof, we will become the after party. Um, if you are on Facebook, watching on Facebook and want to join the after party, um, you need to leave Facebook and enter through the NCHE um, website. And the link is nche.teach.org slash conversations. Um, I also want to say I'm a little I'm a little under the weather today so I, I feel like I was a little a little personally disorderly today in my comments I apologize for that if it seemed that way and if it didn't I feel good but either way um, I hope I see you all next week uh, I wish you all good happy safe weeks uh, and we will have a lot more to discuss I'm sure uh, a week from today so see you guys hey, everybody soon. okay we have to poof become the after